Okay, can you hear me now, Greg? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. What's up? Uh, welcome to the show. You've interviewed me before, but I don't think you've ever been on the kill stream. Uh, no, this so. is my first time. Yeah. 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 Well, welcome to the show. I appreciate you stopping by. Uh, okay. So for those who don't know you, I always did this. Uh, why don't you give us a little uh, background on yourself and what you do, et cetera? Well, I am, I have a PhD in philosophy. I had a brief uh, undistinguished academic career. I was too white and too male, basically, to thrive in postmodern academia. And after that, I got involved in the quote-unquote movement, the white nationalist movement. I was doing stuff behind the scenes for a while, and then in the fall of 2007, I took over publicly as editor of the Occidental Quarterly. I was the editor of the Occidental Quarterly until the spring of 2010. Then, shortly after that, I started Countercurrents Publishing. And Countercurrents Publishing went online uh, in June of 2010, and it's been going for more than 13 years now. And I am the uh, editor-in-chief uh, of the Countercurrents uh, Publishing imprint and the webzine Countercurrents. And Countercurrents, it really has been more known as a webzine, but we published, I think, 80 books over the years. I published 19 of my own books uh, through Countercurrents, and the publishing continues. Uh, but our, our main reach is as a webzine. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of unique visitors every month, and we have a very vibrant community of writers, including people as eminent as Jim Goad. Fred Reed has recently uh, joined us. Uh, other people who are well-known are Spencer Quinn, uh, Travis LeBlanc, uh, Colin Cleary, Jeff Costello, James O'Meara. Uh, I'm, I contribute a lot to the uh, publication under my own name and under the pen name Trevor Lynch when I do movie reviews. I'm just trying to think of some of the other people. Oh, uh, Mark Gullick, who's uh, another philosophy PhD. Uh, yet another philosophy PhD, uh, Stephen Foster. Uh, is a frequent contributor. And all of these guys, they have great credentials or long histories of publishing, but none of us are really stuffy. We, we try and deal with the whole world on a very high intellectual level from a pro-white perspective. Uh, and that includes satirical commentary on the news. It includes discussions of philosophy and political theory, history, literature, and so on. So, uh, Countercurrents is the kind of publication and the kind of publishing imprint that I wish that I had had when I was much younger. I think it would have saved me decades of intellectual you know, struggle, uh, you know, beating around in the bushes of the libertarian world and conservatism, things like that, trying to come up with answers. And so uh, basically it's directed to my younger self and it's directed to people like me uh, it's directed to bright people who are thinking outside the box, who are white or pro-white. We have some people who are non-white readers, but are, they're pro-white in their outlook. They think the things that are happening to white people in the world are you know, the greatest crimes <laughs> ever committed in history, uh, and they're on our side. So uh, th that's really what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm trying to reach out to people, especially to younger people who are bright, and help them stop wasting time. Stop wasting their time with bullshit and propaganda, uh, things that are out there to waste their time and fill their minds with poison uh, and uh, just help us all live, help us get on with our lives, both individually and collectively as nations. That's the goal. Now, tell me what's been the, the hardest part of running Comic Con. Well, uh, let me think. Mostly, it's pushback from the establishment. That's hard. Uh, we have been deplatformed many times. We have been deplatformed from payment processors, uh, credit card processors, PayPal, uh, pl places like that. They got rid of us a long time ago. Stripe, we were eventually blacklisted from the entire global credit card processing industry. So that's oh, been very you on difficult. The matchless, then, is the matchless. we were put yeah. on the matchless. We should be dropping off that. I think you're on there for five years and then you drop off. Uh, we should be dropping off that. I need to check on that. 
of course, they might just stick us back on. Uh, we have made a lot of merchants very unhappy, apparently, and they have tried to strangle us economically. Another big blow came in 2019. At the beginning of 2019, I was in Estonia with Jared Taylor. We were going to the Estonian uh, Independence Day march, and we were participating in a conference there. And I went back to my hotel, and somebody wrote to me and said, Greg, I was in the process of ordering the White Nationalist Manifesto off Amazon, and suddenly it disappeared from the basket, and the listing disappeared from the website. And the next day, I talked to Jared, and he said he had heard that the same thing happened to his White Identity Politics book. And those were the two first books that seemed to have been purged from Amazon. This was in February of 2019. Eventually, they went and purged most of the Countercurrents catalog uh, from Amazon. That is. 70% of the global book market. And then their competition, in quotes, uh, Barnes & Noble, which I think had about 9% of the global book market at that time, they purged most of our stuff as well. So we've been cut off from the global book market. We've been cut off from the credit card processing industry. People have tried to strangle us as an economic entity. And yet we have kept going largely because we've been supported by donations. Uh, that's that's what keeps us afloat. Uh, one of my favorite stories is about The Nation magazine. The Nation magazine is this vanguardist leftist publication. The Nation was founded in 1865. It was founded on the smoldering ashes of the Confederacy by the left liberals of the day as a vanguard publication for left-wing values in America. During its entire existence, it made an economic profit exactly one year. Every other year, the nation has been kept in business by far-sighted leftists who open their wallets and write checks and keep it afloat because they know that it keeps pushing ideas and therefore politics leftward. And they have been extremely successful at that. The left gets metapolitics. They get the importance of ideas. And so they invest in intellectual institutions, intellectual magazines and journals, webzines, and so forth. And the right has somewhat lagged behind that. People in the far right are better about this than the mainstream right. And so we have created a, a metapolitical movement uh, metapolitics just ref is a fancy word that refers to the stuff that you need to convince people of before you can get them on board with your political agenda. And that includes things like explaining that, yes, I'm a white nationalist because I believe that white people as such are being attacked and we're endangered by the current political system. We are discriminated against. Indeed, I think the current political system is, if it's not stopped, is going to lead to the extinction of white people uh, as a race, as a biological entity. We will simply go extinct like the dodo will be replaced. Uh, you have to convince people that that's real. You have to convince people that there are actual alternatives to just going along with people who basically want us extinct. And you can actually show that you can square that with people's consciences, that it's actually a moral and good thing to do. And so those are the kinds of arguments that we try and put forward at Countercurrents. They're questions of our identity, they're questions of the situation we're in, and they're questions about how we can get out of it, their practical ways out, and why it's the right thing to do. So that's, uh, that's what metapolitics politics is from the right, the left gets that, which is why they keep winning. Uh, you know, the left always whines that the right is in, imminently in, in danger of taking over and putting them all in camps. It's complete nonsense. The whole drift of politics since basically 1789 <laughs> has been leftward, uh, dramatically leftward, certainly in the United States, even though you get Republicans in office occasionally. But Republicans, they don't really halt the leftward drift of things. They just try and square it with their, their donors' interests. Uh, so um, what you basically have gotten is a kind of uh, hybrid of what the left wants and what the right wants. The Republican right wants an atmosphere that's conducive to big business. And the left wants pause and white replacement. And what you've gotten is you've gotten a, a system where you get both. You have a really stratified 
extremely unequal oligarchical capitalist system with a completely leftist value structure, uh, which is a hybrid that people like Marx would have laughed at. Uh, people on the right would have laughed at that before World War II, uh, with the exception of Wyndham Lewis. He predicted this back in the 20s. But that's what we have. We have a, 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 an oligarchical society with a left-wing value structure. And the way that the two-party system works is they've made an art of never giving the people what they want. They call that liberal democracy. Liberal democracy just means not giving the people what they want. Uh, and what the people want is they want, and this is true in all white countries if you do polling, the people want a somewhat socially conservative government that's realistic about violence and war, which means that it's not you know, defunding the police uh, or uh, doing unilateral disarmament or going abroad in crazy adventurism, right? Th these, are, these are unrealistic attitudes about force and violence and, and things like that. They want realism, uh, armed realism. But they also want a government that is interventionist against big business for the majority of people, for working people. They want those two things, but they're never allowed to get those two things on the same ticket. Uh, Donald Trump revolutionized American politics for a brief moment, and, and maybe, maybe that moment is closing, maybe that's disappearing, or maybe it'll be with us for a long time. But he came down that golden escalator and he said, basically he was a populist. He was questioning the value of globalization, multiculturalism, and immigration. And he was uh, basically talking about intervening on the side of the American people against the oligarchical interests who were dismantling the American economy and flooding America with non-white immigrants and hurting the American people. He was a populist. But usually what the Democrats will do is they'll say, we'll give you the intervention of state, but you have to have a big side of rainbow colored transgender fries with that interventionist state. Uh, and the Republicans will say, we'll give you social conservatism, but it's got to be connected with pedal to the metal, open borders, globalization, and cutthroat capitalism. And then what they do is they'll run against one another and they'll say, we're not like those horrible Democrats, vote for us because we're unlike the bad people. And the Democrats say, vote for us because we're unlike those horrible Republicans. And they try and keep the issues as vacuous as possible. So they, they want as much as possible simply for you to vote against the other guys so they don't have to offer you anything really specific. They just want a blank check. And then when they're in power with the blank check, they do what their donor class wants. And what does the donor class want? The, the people who write the checks for the Republican Party want big business. They don't want the conservative stuff. And so that's, what's, uh, that's what they get. The big business people get the policies they want, tax cuts for the rich. Conservatives get screwed. If the Democrats are in power, do the people get the interventionist state that they want that, that actually intervenes on the behalf of the little guy? No, they get bloated government giveaways basically to, to minorities and Israel, uh, and they also get tons and tons of social pause, of, of, of ultra leftist values. And with each election cycle, even if they change positions, none of the things are ever reversed. And so we get more oligarchy and we get more pause, no matter who's in power, because that's the preferences of the people who run things. The people who want left-wing values plus capitalism. It sounds like a, a libertarians, right? But there are a lot of people like that. Uh, the, the, that's what neoliberalism means, basically. That's a term that came about in the 90s uh, when Bill Clinton and other leftists made peace with capitalism. Uh, they decided, yeah, we're fine with capitalism, but we just want it as left-wing as possible in its value structure. The, the people who have that value system are about five to seven percent of the electorate and yet they get what they want all the time the people who have a populist value system 
are generally an unbeatably huge percentage of the electorate. It, it varies from country to country, but in the United States, it's more than 60% who would vote for straight up populism. Uh, and yet this tiny minority that wants social liberalism and uh, cutthroat capitalism always wins and the people who, who want populism always lose. They never get populism offered to them straight up. And so, we just want to make people aware of that fact. And I'm a populist. I, I want a interventionist state that intervenes with the econ economic system uh, against, uh, against the big wigs for the people uh, and protects the people. And I was very hopeful because of that uh, for Donald Trump. I, I like populist politics in Europe, people like Viktor Orban, uh, people like the Law and Justice Party in Poland. These were these are uh, parties with promise, leaders with promise, uh, and the tendency going forward is there go, is there going to be more national populism? Brexit with, was a nationalist populist upset. The Front National, now the National Rally in France, is a nationalist populist party. Uh, because of globalization, because of multiculturalism, and because of the breakdown of trust in the political and sort of economic and academic cultural establishment uh, and the people, uh, there's going to be more and more populism going on into the future. So I'm betting on populism as a long-term trend. And, and so kind of countercurrence is very much a intellectual organ for right-wing populism in white countries. All right, now let me ask this and then I'll get into my regular questions, but this got submitted and I'll, I might forget it if I don't ask or else I'd save it to the end. He said, you said you do movie reviews. Did you see Killers of the Flower Moon? And if so, what did you think? I'm going to see that tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, 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 I'm going to see it tomorrow. It's a more than three hour movie, so it's yeah. kind of hard to fit in my schedule. Martin Scorsese is one of the great directors alive today. He's done many absolutely towering classic films. My favorite film of his uh, is Gangs of New York. I think it's a fabulous film. I love I love Taxi Driver. Mean Streets is a very fine film. Goodfellas. Uh, Goodfellas, yeah. Uh, his mafia movies are really good. Uh, I liked, uh, I liked, oh, what was it? I can't think of the name of it now. Um, the Departed is really good too. Actually. The Departed, The Departed, yeah. I like that. Uh, what is the one with Robert De Niro playing the the Jewish uh, guy in Casino? Oh, Casino, yeah, casino. that's epic. yeah, yeah. Uh, he's, he's he's like a fascinating character because the guy's clearly kind of on the autism spectrum, and it's kind of fascinating. Um, no, I I think he's a brilliant director. I also love The Aviator. I think that's yeah. one of the great films that he's done, and it's a great American movie about a great heroic industrial figure, Howard Hughes. So uh, I'm looking forward to this film. His last film, The Irishman, went on a little long, it was a little slow, and this is more than three hours, so I'm, I'm kind of worried, but generally, I don't think he, uh, he disappoints, so I, I'm, I'm just going to block, I blocked out a big chunk of my afternoon tomorrow to go finally see it. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be good. I didn't actually see The Irishman either, um, but I've seen pretty much every other uh, Scorsese movie. I just, I just didn't. I, I don't know. The reviews were kind of lukewarm, and I, like it was so long, and I just never did uh, watch it. But uh, I do need to catch that. And then I, the guy who helps me with the show, chief of staff here, has been trying to encourage me to see uh, this latest movie, but it's so long too, like you said. But anyway, I, I'll get to it sooner or later. Just like I'll get to these questions now, though. Actually, yeah. Uh, Stay Go tuned. Ahead. Countercurrents. Trevor Lynch will review Killers of the Flower Moon right. soon, soonish. All right. Now, uh, what's the uh, pro-white take when it comes to the Israel War, in your opinion, or you know, the War on Gaza, whatever you want to call it? Well, in my opinion, the pro-white take is that neither side is white, uh, <laughs> and both sides are actually hostile and anti-white groups, and therefore. I don't want to take a side in this struggle. Now, I have a sentimental leaning towards the, uh, the Palestinians. And the reason why I have a sentimental uh, leaning towards the Palestinians is that I feel like America is under Jewish occupation as well. And I feel that the Palestinians get a terribly raw deal 
from Israel because of enormous Jewish power in America that basically backs up Israel 100% when they do outrageous things to their neighbors and to the Palestinians. So I feel, I feel shame as an American that my country is a golem being manipulated by its Jewish population, its, its citizens, Jews and foreign Jews, uh, into backing up Israel and allowing it to be a bully in the area. Not just a bully, a bully is, a, if there were only bullies, uh, that would be good. Uh, genocidal, crazed, maniacal, cruel murderers. That's what Israel is to the Palestinians. I don't deny that. And I do feel shame that America enables that kind of behavior. What I would like ultimately to happen in the Middle East is I'd like there to be two states. I'd like there to be a Jewish state and I'd like there to be a Palestinian state. And I would like the Jewish and Palestinian diasporas in white countries to move there. And so the pro-white position on the Israel-Palestine question is basically this, in my view. Uh, we have to be opposed to this bloody conflict. We have to promote a peaceful two-state solution so that Israelis and Palestinians both have homelands to live in so they don't have to live in Europe. Uh, therefore, I cannot root for Hamas because Hamas's goal is the destruction of Israel. And I cannot root for the existing Israeli government and most Israelis and most Jews around the world because their goal is to squeeze the Palestinians completely out and, and just have all that land for themselves and send millions of them as refugees to other countries. And they're talking about sending them to Europe and America. We'll be the suckers who take them in. So if there's no peace in the Middle East, if there's no state for the Jews and no state for the Palestinians, white people will take the brunt of the punishment because we will be the recipients of their diaspora populations. And I don't like that. Now, Palestine, the Palestinian diaspora is not as problematic as the Jewish diaspora. They don't run our politics. They don't run our uh, entertainment industry. They're not poisoning our culture, uh, but they're still problematic. Uh, they still don't fit well. I would like them to be in their own homelands, not in America. And it bothers me intensely when I see battles between Middle Eastern tribes being fought on the streets of European capitals. That should not be allowed to happen. It bothers me intensely to see American politicians and other European, European politicians falling all over uh, one another to fellate Bibi Netanyahu or wh whoever's running Israel at the time. Uh, that's truly disgusting. Watching the American Republican presidential de uh, debates, you'd think they were running for Israel. Well, actually, if they were running for Israel, they would be less slavish to Israel. If they're running for the president of Israel, they'd be less slavish to Israel. Uh, they're running for the, the, basically, these people think that the president of the United States, the only job description that really matters for the president of the United States is who will be the most reliable lapdog for Israel. And that's truly shameful. So uh, again, the, the pro-white thing would be to take our own side, not the Palestinian side, not the Jewish side, and recognize that white interests would be best served if both diaspora groups go to homelands in the Middle East. Uh, and that we won't get that though until white Americans and white Europeans put their foot down and demand that their countries stop enabling Jewish bullying and genocide. Because it wouldn't happen without the enablement provided by the United States and other European and European countries. If, if we have to put our foot down, if we want peace, we have to basically attack the power of the Jewish diaspora community over our politics that it basically will make it impossible for there to be any uh, pro-white resolution to this. Uh, it's really very interesting. Uh, since, since all this has been happening in Gaza, Suddenly, the Republican Party isn't uh, whining about wokeness anymore. 
They're imposing wokeness of their own. They're talking about censoring people. Uh, why? On what grounds? For disliking Israel. Uh, so the people who usually write whining letters to their long-suffering donors saying that they're going to stop this outrageous political correctness on campus, now they are for outrageous political correctness on campus. That's pro-Israel. Uh, Jews don't like freedom of speech. And when the left is in power, they have leftist arguments against freedom of speech. Uh, when the right's in power, they have rightist arguments against freedom of speech. But in both cases, it's largely Jewish lobbying that is militating against the First Amendment in America. And now the Republicans are, are out, again, out there against the First Amendment because Zionists want it that way. Uh, there are laws that are being talked about in France, in Germany, in the UK, making it illegal to hate on Israel. It's not illegal to hate the British people in the UK. It's not illegal to hate Germans in Germany. In fact, that's, that's like their fundamental <laughs> uh, attitude is self-hatred. It's not illegal to hate France the, in France, right? Uh, but it's illegal to hate these foreigners in those countries. That really shows you who these countries are governed for, who really rules uh, in these countries. The, the people who rule are the people you can't insult. And you can get really far in America insulting white Americans. White privilege is a myth. You can get all the way to the top of society by shitting on white people in America, by shitting on the native British in Great Britain, by shitting on the French in France, in Ger the Germans in Germany, etc. Uh, you get to the top in our system by betraying your own people, but you can't cross the line and be anti-Jewish. That's the thing that gets your credit card processing yanked. That's the thing that gets you blacklisted. That's the thing that gets you kicked off of platforms like uh, like uh, Amazon.com, Amazon.com, as I like to call it. <laughs> I think that's appropriate. Uh, now, let me ask you this, uh, more on Israel-Palestine, but um, it could being too pro-Palestinian backfire, I'm pro-Palestinian myself, uh, but do you think that could backfire? Backfire, And then um, where does the right go too far? Or some people on the right go too far in being pro-Palestine? I've noticed also that uh, right-wing people who watch the show who are European, not as pro-Palestinian, uh, yeah. because because they have uh, some different experiences there uh, with with Muslims inside their country and some of these protests and stuff like that. So I have noticed that phenomenon as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I again, uh, it's extremely tempting uh, to just get caught up in the false choice that you've got to take one side or the other. They say, you've got to choose. No, I don't have to choose. Why do I have to choose one side or the other? I choose my own side. Uh, but it's easy to slip out of that uh, and to start thinking in terms of the interests of these other people. And it's, it's an especially uh, a big white disease. Uh, uh, it's why whites are in such a terrible situation. And even in our own countries, the, we, we're easily tricked into basically cuckolding ourselves into uh, forgetting about our own interests and taking care of the interests of other people and feeling very self-righteous and big about that. Uh, and so, yeah, it is, it is dangerous. Uh, there are people on the right who are talking about things like uh, taking the scarce resources of pro-white groups in America and pooling them, as one of these people said, with Arab groups to help them resist uh, the, gov the U.S. government's anti-Arab actions because of what's going on in Gaza. Now, first of all, uh, Arabs have obscene amounts of money. I mean, they're not all rich, but they have access to obscene amounts of money compared to the pro-white movement. And so the idea that we would be sharing our resources with them is just totally laughable. But it's losing the plot. It's losing the point. We have to marshal our resources for our interests and not get basically cuckolded into uh, you know, protectively, gallantly uh, protecting uh, Palestinians. One of the things that's very interesting is that there's actually talk of deportation now of Muslims in Europe. This is wonderful news. 
It didn't matter that these Muslims were preying upon the native British or the native French or the native Germans, but once they started preying on Jews or just scaring Jews by marching through the streets in the hundreds of thousands, then suddenly deportation became an, an issue. I would like to lean in on that. I would like to see that deportation happen. But we now have people who are ostensibly pro-white who have so lost the plot that if Palestinians were being threatened with deportation, they would want to take their scarce resources and throw it into a pot to help Cal Palestinians fight deportation. Th that's a, the clearest sign uh, that you know, they've lost track of where white interests are uh, by being protective uh, of foreigners. So it, it is a danger, uh, but we can, we can get past that. We just have to always focus on our own interests. Now, what you're saying about people in Europe, it's really true. I remember I was in Paris in September of 2001. I think it was less than 10 days after September 11th, I flew to Paris. And I was with some American and British nationalists. Uh, there was a Canadian in the mix, too. Uh, and we all got together in Paris uh, because the Front National was doing their annual rally, the, the, the Fête de Blue Blanc Rouge, and it was really impressive. It's a great big event with tens of thousands of people on the outskirts of Paris showing up uh, for Jean-Marie Le Pen's party. And I got to meet, meet Le Pen. It was, it was a lot of fun. Anyway, I was, uh, I was there in this meeting, and of course, because September 11th had just happened less than 10 days before, everyone wanted to talk about it. And it was interesting, the American delegation was emphasizing the Jewish angle because we all knew that this wouldn't have happened if the United States foreign policy had, was not totally subservient to Israel. That was just blazingly obvious to us. And two thirds of the American public who were polled on this too thought that. Uh, and the people from Great Britain especially uh, were up in arms about Muslims because some of these people worked in offices or factories and they were there on September 11th and they saw these people cheering these terrorist attacks on. I mean, cheering them on. And they felt solidarity with Americans. They felt that these people are dangerous aliens and they wanted out of there. I imagine they felt as alienated as I felt the day that the OJ verdict was handed down uh, that day when the OJ verdict was handed down, I was teaching at a historically black college in Atlanta. And uh, I, I proceeded to watch all these uh, talented 10th black students, male students, literally, literally chimping, basically, in celebration that OJ Simpson got away with double murder. And I felt very alone because I was in a vast sea of blacks. And uh, I, I imagine these Britons felt the same way, seeing this dangerous fifth column of Muslims in their country gleeful at this, these massive terrorist attacks on a brother nation. So I, I get why that is. They, they have a bigger Muslim problem there. And the, the conversation got kind of heated. It was going back and forth, right? And at a certain point, I just sat back and I thought, you know, if we're deporting, if we're debating who's worse for white people, Muslims or Jews, no matter what people decide in the end, it's not a debate that we can, that white people can lose, right? Uh, if, if we're talking in terms of white, uh, white interests, and talking about which group is most inimical to white interests, since they're both inimical, uh, this is a healthy debate. And I sort of leaned back and just started enjoying it and started thinking, God, if we could only get the whole society debating that way. And that provided me with a sort of moment of insight. I realized that's how we're ruled, <laughs> right? Uh, if you get people, if you frame the, the terms of debate in such a way that your side can't lose, then you don't have to worry about which side wins. Uh, and that's sort of how Jewish hegemony, Jewish power works in the West. Uh, they have set up the political system in such a way that if the center right's in power, they're very pro-Jewish. If the center left's in power, they're very pro-Jewish. So it doesn't matter ultimately to them who's 
who's in power? The different sides trade power, but Jewish interests are safe. In fact, Jewish interests are sacrosanct in these countries, whereas the natives' interests aren't. So I would like to live in a society where white interests are sacrosanct, and we can have all the political pluralism anyone could desire. We could be debating about taxes and abortion and the economy, back and forth, on and on. But if being pro-white is the bedrock assumption of everybody in the debate, then white people can't lose. And that's, that's sort of my vision of utopia. All right, now I see North 3434 and the Super Chat says, fuck Israel and fuck Palestine. He's very consistent uh, with that position there. Um, all right, now we'll get back to, to those. I have some more questions on that, but um, how would you define your critique towards what you call exterminationists uh, and how is their message unrealistic and is there any middle ground? Well, there are people that I've known over the years who basically... They, they get this idea that the, the best way to deal with your enemies is just to kill them all. Uh, well, <clears throat> it certainly is a final solution. Uh, but the, the fact that, A, it's, it's just blatantly immoral. Uh, I do believe there's such thing as rights. People have rights, uh, and you can't just murder people. Yes, if people attack you, you attack them back. I believe in the right of self-defense and so forth. But just killing everybody in a, in a group that you don't like, well, that's, that's the totalitarian, dystopian hell world that I don't want to be a part of. I, I, I don't want to take part in that. That's what I'm fighting against. That's the world I want to get away from. I want to get to a world where there are no stateless peoples that are easily susceptible to genocide. Uh, and so that's why I'm a new rightist. Uh, I, I share a lot of things with the old right, the interwar right. I'm a race realist. I do believe there is a real Jewish question. I'm a nationalist. I'm a populist. And yet I don't believe in the kinds of techniques that these people uh, advocated. I don't believe in the totalitarian state, the mass political parties, the the charismatic leaders, the, the terrorism, the genocide, the war, you know, the, the violent revolutionary stuff like that. I, I think we can take certain good things uh, out of these uh, movements and ideologies, and we can slough off the stuff that's counterproductive and, and morally wrong. Uh, and that's why I define myself as a new rightist. And it's quite analogous to the new left. The new left looked at the Marxist tradition and then looked at the absolute horrors wrought by Marxism in power and thought, well, isn't there a way that we can save certain core insights from Marx without all this gulag stuff, right? Uh, and they tried to create a synthesis, uh, a post-totalitarian left. I think we need a post-totalitarian right. Uh, and that's, that's what I, I fight for. And it irritates me that there are people who basically have an attitude about their enemies that, uh, well, put it this way, I feel that the right, the ethno-nationalist right that I represent, needs to present solutions to the problems of the world. What are the problems of the world? Things like ethnic cleansing, genocide, war, uh, the destruction of cultures and peoples. That's the main problem that we face. I, I think that white people are being susceptible, uh, subjected to a slow genocide. And that's what I want to stop. Well, what's the solution to that? Well, the solution is, as best we can, to create sovereign homelands for distinct peoples, because Stateless peoples are the ones who are easily susceptible to genocide. That includes the Jews of Europe in the Second World War. And yes, they really were genocided. It wasn't all a hoax. Or the Armenians who were susceptible, uh, subjected to a genocide. And there have been many other genocides. Uh, Greek Christians in the Ottoman Empire, Assyrian Christians. Uh, these people were uh, subjected to genocides by the Turks because they had no state of their own. So stateless people are easily slaughtered, and therefore that's why you want them to have states of their own. 
Beyond that, you need international law. You need international institutions where people can come together and try and deal with conflicts without going to war. All of these are good things. Uh, and that's the, the world that I want to move towards. That's the kind of vision I feel like I'm obligated to give. And so I'm always asking people who get really kind of giddy and priapic about uh, <laughs> events like uh, the ones in Gaza, Gaza. It's like they're frothing at the mouth and, it's a, and they're saying, yes, Israel can go down. Israel. I remember once, this was in 2006, I was at the American Renaissance Conference and Guillaume Fai was there. And Guillaume Fai at one point in his talk said the state of Israel could cease to exist. And people in the audience clapped and he looked utterly shocked. I have to admit that in the spirit of pure mischief, I was clapping along too. Uh, but afterwards, a friend of mine said, you know, Greg, if Israel ceased to exist, they'd all be here. And I thought, yeah, shit, <laughs> they would all be here. Uh, and that's the last thing I want. I want them in Israel, not uh, 7 million reinforcements to Jewish power in America. That would make everything worse. So I, I realized you, you simply can't not take a stand on this issue. Uh, if Somebody asks you, and I ask people all the time, it's like, okay, if you want Israel destroyed, where are the Jews going to go? And they get angry at you because they, they, they hope that they'll just go up the chimney. They'll, they hope they'll disappear. But that's not a realistic solution. It's not going to happen. What's going to happen, they're not going to get their wish, which is genocide. What's going to happen is they'll come in the millions to the West. And the Jewish question will get that much more problematic <laughs> because they'll be massively reinforced and there's no place to send them except to basically to another European country. Then they just become, you know, they, they, they would never cease being a problem for white people. Uh, and I, I don't want that. So I think uh, it's incumbent upon people who are serious about politics to say, uh, well, where do you think these problem people should go? I uh, and yeah, and, and I think they should go to Israel. And I want Israel to <laughs> succeed and flourish. And I think it's a beautiful thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, there's a great deal of crazed frothing at the mouth from Jews and Jewish allies on social media right now because of Gaza. They're all hysterical. Um, but you have to say there's some beautiful things coming out. Uh, one of the stories that really impressed me was dead Israeli men are having their sperm harvested, <laughs> you know, so that their wives can bear their children after they're dead. Now, I think that's a sign of an extremely healthy people that has a will to propagate itself into the future. That's healthy. Uh, and uh, I, I think a healthy nationalism is a beautiful thing, even if it's the nationalism of our enemies. Uh, of course, I don't want them to be enemies. And I, for years, I've said this, and it's, it's true. Uh, when I started thinking in terms of being pro-white, I did not initially think that that entailed being anti-Jewish. Uh, I was very much like Jared Taylor in some ways. In fact, I had generally positive attitudes towards Jews because being an intellectual, there are a lot of interesting Jewish teachers and writers that I read. Uh, people like Leo Strauss and Hannah Arendt. They were important to my intellectual development. So I, I was kind of a neocon. There were years when I subscribed to Commentary Magazine in the 90s, believe it or not, and the new Criterion. So I initially didn't want to be their enemy, but I realized that every time I would take a pro-white stance on anything, they would come with knives, you know, not pitchforks and torches like those like, like those peasants in Europe. They'd come at you with knives, uh, and uh, and they wouldn't come at you directly. They'd come at you from behind, or there would be whispering campaigns. They'd try and destroy you. And they chose me as their enemy. That's the point. I didn't choose them. Uh, and uh, but once you once you wake up to the fact that your enemy gets to choose you, you might not want to be enemies with anybody. And that's my default wish. I don't want to be enemies with anybody. But your enemy also has a choice, and he can choose you. 
Uh, and, and that's why we have this struggle. But the end of that struggle, in my view, would be a situation where we have our own homelands and our own nationalisms, and we try and, you know, stay separate and get along. All right, now, uh, I have a lot more question, questions on Israel. We'll see if we can double back uh, to that. But I wanted to ask you about Ukraine uh, and make sure I got that in there. What are your current thoughts on the war in Ukraine? Well, the war in Ukraine is a terrible crime. Uh, it's a crime committed by largely Putin, in my opinion. Uh, and I am 100% sympathetic to the Ukrainian people. Ukraine is their homeland. It's the only homeland they have. And it was invaded by people who deny that Ukraine is a, a country and deny that the Ukrainians are a people uh, who came there saying that they, they came there flying the flag of the Soviet Union, the flag of the people who starved and butchered tens of millions of Ukrainians and oppressed them for uh, decades, generations, and uh, coming claiming that they were anti-Nazis. They were there to denazify them. Now, the Russians use Nazi in the same way that Jews use Nazi in the West. They use the word Nazi to stigmatize the healthy nationalism of any enemy nation. And therefore, to denazify Ukraine was, would basically be to destroy the Ukrainian identity, to destroy their sense of uh, being a distinct people, to suppress their language, their literature, their heroes, uh, their, their political leaders and so forth and try and basically uh, reduce, the, reduce Ukraine to just sort of a, a blonde farm for the Russian Empire, uh, which is what it was under the Soviets and what it was under the czars too. Uh, and uh, I, I, I understand completely why the Ukrainians want to uh, resist being subsumed into that empire. They are a distinct people, they have a distinct history, uh, they feel like they are an older people than the Russians, that Russia is an offshoot of Ukraine, uh, a wayward, ungrateful child that sort of grew up to be, uh, you know, large, uh, super large with retard strength and, uh, and has menaced, menaced them for hundreds of years now. So I'm 100% on the side of the Ukrainians. Uh, and the, the, one of the things that got me on the side of the Ukrainians when initially all this started happening in 2013, and I was sort of looking on, trying to figure out what my take was, one of the things that got me on the side of the Ukrainians was having Russian propagandists coming at me and telling me blatant, insulting lies. Uh, and the, the tone of, and the content of Russian propaganda to this day is a massive insult to the intelligence. If you, if you read the Russian takes on this, uh, there's no Russian war on Ukraine. They call this the war against Russia. And idiots in the West who have uh, swallowed their propaganda, people like Tucker Carlson, who should know better, talk about the war against Russia. Are you, you, know, are you kidding me? There, there is no war against Russia. There is a Russian war against Ukraine. But what the Russian, propaganda line is, is that Ukraine is a fake nation. They don't even exist. They're like the Palestinians. They're not a real people. They don't deserve a homeland. They don't even exist. They just have false consciousness. They're just there to bedevil us. Well, how did all these people with false consciousness come to bedevil poor mother Russia? Well, this is an op of foreign intelligence. Uh, under the czars, they claim that Ukrainian ethnic identity was just an operation of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. These uh, the the Austrians in Vienna had hatched this this plot to make these people think that they're a different nation, and really they're not. Uh, and the 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 current version of this is that somehow it's the West and especially America that's really uh, at stake here. Uh, it's it's a war between America and Russia, or a war between NATO and Russia. There are new Ukrainians. Uh, this is the kind of line that comes out of Moscow. It's an extremely dangerous framing because what they're saying is that they're actually at war with another nuclear power. Uh, but 
you, 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 get bo you get boxed into crazy and dangerous things by believing your own bullshit. Uh, and the, the bullshit line that comes out of Moscow is there are no Ukrainians. And the people who think they are, well, they must think they are because poor Mother Russia's enemies are encircling her uh, and trying to bedevil her. Uh, and, and now uh, the devil, in this case, is, is America. Uh, I, I just think that's a, that's a ridiculous, childish narrative. Uh, another thing that they came at us hard and fast with, and they still come at us with, is the claim that in 20, uh, 2014, there was a coup, an American coup in Ukraine that uh, ejected uh, Yanukovych. There was no coup. Uh, this, was, this was a complete lie. And it was a lie that was first shat out by the Ukrainian Communist Party, uh, right on the spot. Uh, the standard sort of paranoid gutter leftist line about anything they don't like is to blame it on the CIA. And so that's what they did. And basically, uh, Moscow ran with it, and it has just been passed around the down the human centipede, basically, of, uh, of Russia propagandists and, and uh, clients, uh, shills in the West, that there was a coup. There wasn't a coup. Uh, th these are these are these are massive facts that are just denied, uh, and and I found that so insulting that it really uh, caused me to just shrink back in horror from this, and it 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 created a great deal of uh, bad feeling, ill will, and distrust uh, on my part towards people in the pro white movement at the time. Who were just uh, basically conduits of, of these uh, these talking points, and at the time, the principal conduit was Richard Spencer uh, at, at Radix. Uh, that was his platform, and he's had a 180 degree turn on this because he's divorced his uh, Russian wife, uh, who seemed to have been wearing the the, the pants uh, and the jack boots at the time. Uh, but uh, other people have taken up that because. It wasn't just an accident that there are people on the right who do this kind of propaganda. It's an operation. There's an operation on the part of Russian intelligence, probably military intelligence, to have outreach and subversion uh, towards all shades of political radicalism and discontent in other countries. And I saw this for a long time. It came into focus in 2013, 2014, after, around the time of the Maidan, uh, and then the uh, invasion of Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. Uh, that's when it really came into focus for me. Uh, and I started following it very closely. And, and the model of this uh, was like the Soviet peace movement, uh, which was just a KGB op. Uh, you know, there is, a, there is a Russian intelligence operation directed at the dissident right in America to basically uh, cuckold white interests and instead take on Jewish interests, or not Jewish interests, pardon me, um, Russian interests. Uh, and so uh, we have the, the, the obscenity and the irony of a movement that's up in arms about how our own governments have been hollowed out by foreign interests and our leaders are basically putting the interests of foreigners over and above us. And then, uh, no sooner are these people up and running that they, they just fall victim to some kind of operation to do the same for Russia. As long as it's branded in a sort of rightist way, uh, you know, they, they, fall, they fall for it hook, line, and sinker. So yeah, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, I, and I'm thinking of groups like the National Justice Party in America. They're the, they're the basically the successors of Spencer uh, in being a conduit for this kind of uh, Russian propaganda. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it because uh, you have, quote unquote, I mean, you have people who are, this, this is like Nick Griffin in the UK. Nick Griffin would, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, uh, signal that he's a neo-Nazi. And of course, all these NJP people are Nazis. And, uh, and then uh, these, uh, these not-so-wink-wink-nudge-nudge -nudge Nazis uh, are, are now uh, backing the denazification of Ukraine. I, I'm sorry, uh, 
maybe maybe I'm just not cynical enough for politics, but I find that shocking and despicable, frankly. And I wonder how any of these people ha can look at themselves uh, in in the mirror in the morning. I think that they're so crooked they have to screw their jackboots on every morning, and I think that's a bad look uh, for people who want to lead a political movement. Because honestly, all we've got is the truth. That's our only thing that sets us apart from the mainstream. We've got the truth. We don't have any money. We don't have any power. We don't control the media, but we do tell the truth about important things. And then just just see them blatantly telling ridiculous lies uh, because they're rooting for some foreign power in an imperialist war against a white people and a white people that, by the way, harbors the most well-organized racial nationalist movement in the world. I mean, these people, and I think it's kind of weird. I think it's weird that Ukrainians are Nazis. Why? Because Hitler wanted to colonize the, their, their country with the Germans and basically reduce them to the status of serfs. Well, I guess they're big enough to overlook little things like that. But there are a lot of Ukrainians uh, who are just Nazis. It comes out of the black metal subculture, which is huge there. Uh, it comes out of the mixed martial arts and soccer hooligan subcultures. The, these, these are subcultures that are rife with fashy memes. But these people aren't just hooligans. They actually formed armies and political parties uh, and meta-political organizations. They're actually amazingly impressive people. I've met a number of these people. Uh, I, I respect a lot of these people. Uh, these are the people that Western quote-unquote Nazis, or not quote-unquote Nazis, just Western Nazis, uh, should be queuing up to kiss their asses and take notes. And instead, these people, because they think that they might get some Putin bucks, somehow directed into their Swiss bank account or whatever, uh, because these people think they might get some kind of favor, they are, they're, they're saying these people are fake. They're saying these people are working for the American government or the CIA or George Soros. It's utterly disgusting and shameful. Now, let me, before I ask you a couple more Ukraine questions, um, what do you think of Spencer's evolution? Do you think that's honest um, political evolution or... Spencer, I think the best way to understand Spencer is to completely dispense with the category of honesty altogether. Uh, I, think you, it, I think it's massively clarifying if you just drop the idea that he's sincere about anything. Uh, what drives Spencer is basically narcissism. Uh, when I knew him, uh, he was just filled with loathing and rage for mainstream conservatives. Why? Because, well, they didn't buy his bullshit. Uh, they, didn't, they weren't all that impressed with him, as indeed I was not all that impressed with him. Uh, they, he went to work at the American Conservative and got fired after a while. I don't think he ever forgave them for that slight because he would just go on about them. And if, there's, if there are things that I hate, I don't spend my time looking at it all the time, right? Uh, but he would like hate watch, uh, you know, YouTube clips of uh, mainstream conservatives, right? The, these, these people that he despised uh, or mainstream comment, conservative commentators and just rant about it. Uh, and I, I just thought that was obviously weird and unhealthy. Uh, and I realized that the Spencer Code is that he finds a constituency that should be his natural constituency. And then he goes into that constituency and he counter signals them in every possible way. So he went to the American conservative and he was probably uh, talking about ethical child porn even then, uh, or you know, being anti-Christian or whatever. Uh, why? Well, to get attention. Does he think this is going to get him positive attention? Well, that's what he'd like, uh, but negative attention will do. Uh, there, there is a kind of narcissism of the ugly and the repulsive. Now, he's not ugly, but he is repulsive as a person. Uh, and uh, re repulsive people still have narcissism, and the way that they satisfy their narcissism is by 
being repulsive to people and upsetting people. And that's sort of the Spencer code. So he goes into the conservative movement. He countersickles his way until they boot him out. Then he goes to the alternative right platform. Uh, he's charming and he has a he comes from money and he knows how to dress. And so that just caused all kinds of tingles uh, for people like uh, Bill Regnery, uh, who thought, okay, this guy could be a, a good spokesman. And so they set him up uh, after Taki Mag, uh, they set him up with alternative right. And uh, then his tone became increasingly just a matter of, you know, it, first he wanted everyone to love him and worship him and follow him. And when that wasn't going so well, then he started trying to destroy the people who wouldn't go along with the cult of Richard Spencer. Uh, and then when everybody tired of him, he turned against them like he turned against the conservative movement. And now basically, uh, he just does stuff like Richard Hanania does, uh, just sort of posts cringe that uh, is, is basically designed to make people like me vomit. Uh, and uh, he gets his jollies from that. Uh, and it's all basically his inflamed narcissism. Uh, and, and truth plays no role in this whatsoever. I, I would like to say, you know, welcome to the side of the righteous on Ukraine, Richard. But probably he's more motivated by the fact that he just loathes his ex-wife. <laughs> You know, I mean, th that's understandable. Yeah, it's uh, it's sad, but that's true. There are people like this. Uh, and I'm sure that he has glimmers of honesty and glimmers of sincerity. But I don't want to dig through great mountains of bullshit to find those. I, I'm not my li life is short. I don't have time to excavate th this great pile of Richard Spencer bullshit for for something that's a genuine gem. Nobody has the obligation to do that. By and large, I just think He's a dishonest person, and there's absolutely no value in anything that he says. He might be like a stop clock right twice a day, but the stop clock is not actually a good timepiece, right? Uh, and, and, and so uh, just because the, the, the clock is stopped at the right time twice a day doesn't mean that you should rely upon it for anything or waste your time watching its twi Twitter feed. So those, those are my thoughts on Richard. All right, now uh, I'll veer it back to Ukraine. Um, how could the West have managed to help Ukraine more? Uh, what do you think is in it for the West? Uh, and let's see, a lot of the issues, the advanced weapons desired, uh, taking a long time to train the troops uh, in some European countries, kind of bucking a little bit. You see a little bit of people kind of, well, governments being a little more lukewarm uh, on Ukrainian support since the Gaza-Israel thing happened and leaks in the media oh, yeah. about, oh, they, you know, what are they talking about as far as peace goes and stuff like that? I don't know if you've seen that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Basically, I... I wish that the West had done better by Ukraine. They've given them a lot of money. There's no question about that. And they, but they've actually kept this. Uh, they've kept them on a kind of IV drip. Uh, and uh, you know they're saying, okay, you could have these weapons, but don't fire them across the border into Russia. Whatever you do, uh, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, they are not trying to arm Ukraine to win decisively. They're trying to arm Ukraine so that the war goes on as long as possible. Why do they want to do that? Well, because they're evil psychopaths, basically. Uh, and they're not trying to end a war between a overwhelmingly white nation and another nation with tens and tens of millions of white people in it. A war that's destroying white lives and wrecking a white country. They, the a pro-white West would have worked as quickly as possible to bring this war to an end. But as we as we know, we don't have a pro-white government. We don't have a pro-white establishment. So what is the establishment trying to do? Well, there there are layers uh, of motivations here. In Europe, there are large numbers of people who were just utterly horrified. I, I was in Europe when the war started and a woman came to me that I'd only seen just, you know, in passing. And she knew I was an American and she wanted to talk to me about this. Oh, isn't it terrible that war has come to Europe again? 
I mean, Europe has been devastated by wars. America has not been devastated by wars since the Civil War. Europe has been devastated by wars in the 20th century. And so Europeans have an especial horror of war. Uh, and I think even on the, the in, somewhere in the souls of even these soulless Eurocrats and these sellouts, they feel a horror that war has returned to Europe. And I think that's true. However, uh, maybe their first instinct is to do the right thing and to, and to rush to Ukraine's aid and to try and bring this war as quickly as possible to some kind of end. But the United States has really taken the lead on this, and the United States policy on Ukraine is basically less pro-Ukrainian than anti-Russian. The United States wants this war to go on for a very long time so that it weakens Russia in the hope, I think, that Russia has regime change, that Russia undergoes some kind of collapse. Now, when the war started, I was fully a believer that despite all of his flaws, his, you know, the fact that he had a very bad ideology and that he was a, a crook, that Putin had done many things to improve Russia and it made Russia a much stronger country. I watched in great surprise at how poorly the Russian military performed. And it became apparent that a lot of Putin's improvements were just Potemkin improvements, and that the trajectory of corruption and decline that he had inherited had continued, and that Russia was a much weaker society and a much more corrupt society than, than I thought it was, and that many Western Westerners thought it was. But I think that American intelligence probably knew about these levels of corruption uh, and weakness and thought that if Russia got into this war, it could be quickly humiliated and there could be collapse and regime change. And I think that's what they want. Uh, I don't think they like the independence of Putin from their, their particular plans. Uh, and so uh, I, I think, especially in the United States, which has an overwhelmingly neoconservative and Jewish uh, policy establishment, uh, there's a deep hatred of Russia. It's just an irrational hatred of Russia uh, because of so many Russian Jewish ex emigres came to America uh, with all kinds of uh, horror stories about the czar. Uh, so I, I think that, that that's part of it. There's, a, there's sort of a, a, a racial animus against the Russians embedded in foreign policy in America uh, that wants to see Russia weak and and uh, collapsed and maybe dismembered, uh, and certainly under greater control of the United States, because that's really the center of Jewish power in America. It's not in Tel Aviv, it's in Washington, D.C., and New York. Uh, and I, I think that that's what's going on. Now, I think, so, I think that's what's driven the, the, uh, the way the war has been conducted, the, the way the aid has been conducted to Ukraine. Uh, again, if we had pro-white governments that were genuinely animated by a horror of war and the horror of destruction of white life and white amity, that they would have intervened as quickly as possible uh, and tried to bring this to an end. Intervened in all kinds of ways, the sanctions, diplomatic pressures, arming Ukraine, etc., whatever it would take. But they don't, we don't have that kind of rulership. And so I think the war has been artificially prolonged simply to waste white life and to, uh, and to weaken Russia. And I think that's a giant crime. Uh, it's almost as big a crime as the invasion was to begin with. Now, um, last couple of questions on that. What, what do you think Zelensky's biggest mistake was or Ukraine's? And then what do you think uh, Putin's has been so far in the war? Well, um, Zelensky has performed remarkably well, honestly. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not going to second guess him uh, in any way. I think the greatest problem that the Ukrainians have had, and this is something that I've, I've aired with my Ukrainian friends and they just sort of roll their eyes at me like I'm naive. Uh, but I've said this for years. Okay, look, 
let's say that that uh, that Putin gets to keep uh, Crimea and Donbass, these these territories. Uh, that means that Ukraine has fewer Russians. Uh, Ukraine has lost all of its, almost all of its Muslims, its Tatars, the, the, the Muslim Tatars that live in Crimea. Uh, that means that Ukraine is a slightly smaller but more homogeneous society. As nationalists, shouldn't you want that? And uh, shouldn't you just, you know, try and uh, basically uh, secure some kind of end of hostilities? Because... The hostility started in 2014, and this this war that's happened is just a continuation of hostilities that started in 2014. There could have been a time, any time between 2014 and the beginning of this war, when there was some kind of cessation of hostilities, uh, and the the nationalists that I knew, I thought, were conceptually best capable of framing a way of doing that uh, in terms of maybe having a smaller but more homogeneous nation. But their attitude was the following. And these are the three things that I consistently heard. One, all this stuff about Russians in the East is just a transparent fake pretext. Uh, if we were to grant, if we were to say, yeah, okay, take this territory with these Russian, ethnic Russians, fine. Uh, they, they, that uh, Putin would just come up with another pretext. And in fact, he did. He came up with the NATO pretext. Uh, and uh, that, the, that the goal was simply to take all of Ukraine and reassemble, basically, the old Soviet empire. And that really is what a lot of Russians want. They, they think that the loss of Russia's empire was a terrible blow, and they would like to put it all back together. Uh, and Ukraine is the first place they want to go. Why? Because Belarus is basically a, a completely, uh, just a complete total <laughs> subservient satellite. Uh, but Ukraine, Ukraine has aspirations of being an independent nation and looks west. Now they'll deal with the tiny Baltic states later. Uh, and of course, they're in NATO, so that would be nuclear war if they tried to grab those. Uh, they they want to. Uh, Russia has. Uh, meddled in the Caucasus, it's meddled in the various stands, it's meddled in Ukraine uh, as well, uh, Moldova, uh, all these uh, former Russian and Soviet imperial territories they've, they've meddled in, uh, and they would like to bring these back under their control. And that's what the Ukrainians firmly believe. Uh, beyond that, uh, they feel that the presence of these Russians there uh, is like the Ulster plantation uh, in in Ireland. It, the it's like the, the the native Irish look upon the Ulster plantation. Uh, they look upon this as Russian colonialism, and they want to undo it. Now, at a, at a certain point, I just think you have to say you just have to let bygones be bygones. Uh, but a lot of these people, they don't see it that way. They want that territory back. Uh, they resent the fact that many Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainians, speak Russian as a first language. Why was that? Because they were forcibly Russified under the Tsars and then under the Soviets. They want to uh, restore their language. It's like the Irish wanting to restore Gaelic. I get it. I get it. It's a it's an anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist, nationalist form of self-assertion. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, these racial nationalist types that I know in Ukraine have also argued that taking such positions would put them to the left of normie Ukrainians. <laughs> and that's really true. Uh, the, the, the people in Ukraine are hardy deep-seated uh, nationalists, uh, sometimes in the most petty ways, the, the people that I've met. And uh, even if they wanted to, even if the, like the right sector people or the Svoboda people, uh, these very based parties of the far right, wanted some kind of settlement, 
they would have an open rebellion in their own ranks and in the broader Ukrainian electorate. Uh, if Zelensky wanted to have a settlement, the first danger he'd face would be people probably in his own entourage. Uh, they, they're just very stubbornly opposed to uh, being pushed around and losing territory and being lied to uh, and being, you know, being slaughtered uh, by Russians. Uh, and they, they're, they're just not going to end this easily uh, without, ultimately, they, I don't think they're going to uh, want to stop us until they get all their lost territory back. I don't think that's even possible. But their attitude is, well, no, it's everything, anything is possible. Uh, Russia's a paper tiger. Uh, Russia could collapse any moment. Uh, you know, the, the, there are Ukrainians I know who are talking about partitioning greater Russia. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that that's unrealistic. Uh, my attitude was also, the, my pragmatic attitude, and again, this would just get eye-rolling, uh, you know, friendly, patronizing eye-rolling, uh, would have been, look, why can't you just temporize for a while? Just wait, just delay. Putin isn't gonna live forever. Uh, and when Putin's dead, uh, things might get a lot easier. You might have somebody far more tractable uh, in office. I think that would have been, honestly, if, if I'm gonna cr criticize the Ukrainians on anything, it's like, okay, you have, Vaunting ambition, vaulting ambitions, I should say. You have amazing ambitions. You want to take back all your territory. You want to decolonize your people. You want to wipe away centuries of humiliation. Okay, fine. Can you wait? Can you wait 20 or 30 years? <laughs> you know, uh, maybe Putin will be dead and uh, there won't be as formidable an opponent. In the Kremlin, uh, I, I think maybe that's the that's the only error I would really lay at their feet. Maybe they should have just been more patient uh, and just sort of played played the little Minsk games and you know done done the kind of complete bullshit that we we saw for decades with Israel and Palestine. The, the peace process. Remember the peace process that never eventuated in peace. Uh, I think the Ukrainians should have just done a peace process for 20 or 30 years until Putin was dead, uh, and then maybe they could have gotten everything they wanted. Anyway, those are my thoughts. All right. Now, I have some philosophy uh, questions, but I'll, I'll round it out with that, and I'll ask some of these personality questions uh, first. Uh, what are your thoughts on the NJP? They got mentioned earlier uh, as an organization. Uh, it's my understanding you've had difficulties and have offered to debate repeatedly but haven't gotten a response. Um. Well, I don't know if I've offered you debate. Uh, I mean, it's been talked about. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, but here's the thing. I used to be, to use a Mike Enochism, here's the thing. I used to be very friendly with some of these people at TRS. But, you know, that was, I guess that was like high school. And, uh, you know, you, how many people from high school are you still friends with, right? Um, and so... Uh, you know, we, we went our separate ways, and I really haven't followed a lot of the stuff that they've been doing since 2017. Things would come up, uh, but I, I didn't really follow them uh, until the war started, and I started seeing the, the line that they took. And it's like, ah, I've seen this propaganda before. I've seen this bullshit before. Uh, and I think that it's uh, it's shameless. Uh, it's shameless and it's wrong, uh, intellectually and morally wrong. Uh, and it, it bothers me that people that I used to like, uh, used to think were clever and, uh, and honorable, uh, are, are doing this because I think that their behavior is dishonest and dishonorable. Now, there are some people who have come into the mix uh, since I sort of went out of their sphere, uh, like uh, the striker character, Joe Jordan, I just think is a thoroughly dishonest person. I've had a few interactions with him and he literally can't go five minutes without lying. And I just don't see any value in having people like that around. Uh, people say, oh, have you read Stryker's recent article? And I said, why would I read his article? I'd have <laughs> to fact check everything. 
uh, I ain't got time for that. Uh, life's too short for that. Uh, life's too short when you realize that somebody's dishonest, you close the book and you, uh, you move on. Well, you know, politics is long, life is short. I don't have time for dishonest people. I think, however, the rank and file of NJP is better than their leadership. That's my impression. There are people who are involved in NJP that are honorable people. They're looking for something. They're looking for community. They're looking for political activism. Uh, they, it's not just a cult of personality. The thing that I didn't like about TRS is that it went from being a community of really interesting people. It, it formed organically out of Facebook groups that were basically coalescing in the aftermath of the Ron Paul 2012 campaign and then encountered the first waves of Black Lives Matter with Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, that kind of stuff. And they started reading racialist, white nationalist discourse. They started reading people like Kevin McDonald. They started publicly educating themselves and bringing along people because they were interesting and engaging. And it was in 2014 that I started paying attention to them and I thought these people are very interesting and very talented. I got into their Facebook group and it was an interesting group of people. And it was not the kind of people who would be involved in NJP or TRS today. Uh, uh, they, uh, they turned their back on a lot of the people who sort of got them started, people who were their friends, people who created memes with them, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they went Hollywood. They, 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 you know, that's sort of the feel. Um, something that was spontaneous and organic uh, became both a business and it also became a kind of rigidly uh, national so socialist ideological uh, setup. And that repulsed a lot of the earlier people who were involved in it. Um, but still, some of the people that I knew way back when are, are still involved. Uh, and they're not mind-numb cultists or anything. They're very clever people. But what I saw happening uh, as it got bigger and bigger is that it started getting this kind of, I wouldn't call it a cult dynamic, although some people would call it a cult. It's uh, certainly a cult of personality in some cases. Um, I would certainly say it's a strong clique dynamic. And I, I think maybe the closest sociological analogy to what TRS and the NJP is, is that it's a, it's a fan scene. It's like, they're like Trekkies or Star Wars nerds or people into the Marvel Cinematic Universe or bronies. Remember bronies? Uh, you know, they, they have their conventions. They're, they're, they're TRS cons, they're, which is like brony cons and <laughs> Star Trek conventions and things like that. Um, NJP, you know, the, the National Justice Party, uh, you know, it, the, these are more like comic cons and fan conventions. Uh, and I don't think they're actual political. It's actually a political movement. Uh, it's not organized as a political movement. I don't know if they're planning to run for office or anything. Uh, what it is is a, is a fan scene, an organized fan scene that grew up around this podcasting, uh, this, this one podcast and this podcasting network. Uh, and again, I think that a lot of the people in it are better than the leaders. Uh, and so I, I don't want to uh, throw shade on all of the followers because I think some of them are really great people. Uh, and I'm sure ones that I don't know are also great people, but their leaders, I think are really dishonorable people. I've come to think uh, of, of Stryker as just a dumb, dishonest shithead, which is what I described, uh, how I described him to Mike Enoch. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, Mike, I think is still an intelligent person, but I just think he's, he's obviously kind of lazy and weak minded because he puts up with really bad people, uh, around him, bad, dishonest people. Uh, but the, the real person that I, I think, uh, is just villainous is, is Sven. And I, I have to, uh, I have to say that he was the one that I liked the most when I initially met him. I just, wow, what a warm, kind person. 
but the pattern with him is that the, you know the, you know this there's the spencer code well the sven code is basically suck up shit down uh and i what i mistook for warmth and friendliness was just him sucking up that was the suck up portion of our relationship the suck up phase of the relationship uh, and then it graduated eventually to the shit down uh, phase of the relationship. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think you can you can build any kind of real camaraderie or friendship with somebody who uh, operates on that model. Uh, and, and so you you go into this, your heart full of optimism and uh, idealism, right? And you think, okay, we're in this we're in a cause together and we're going to do something great for our people. Uh, meanwhile, you, you find that you've entered the company of people who are anxiously studying their balance sheets, both financially and in terms of social standing. They're anxiously eyeing you. Do I suck up or shit down? You can't have camaraderie. You can't have collegiality. You, you can't have a real movement with people like that. Uh, and I, I just think the guy's villainous and, and poisonous. And uh, it's increasingly obvious with the kind of rants that he goes on uh, talking about how he wants to murder his enemies, uh, how poor white people are disgusting and he looks down on them. Uh, I, I just don't think there's much uh, future uh, with people like that in a, a so-called populist movement, uh, I, I don't see I don't see much love or co camaraderie or uh, even just basic collegiality being possible with people like that. So yeah, I, I don't think anything good is going to come out of that organization, out of TRS as a network, or and NJP as a party. Uh, the only good that will come out of it are the good people who finally just say. Uh, I'm I'm through with this bullshit. Now let me ask you this: um, What about Nick Fuentes and the Groypers and America First? Um, you, know, you mentioned cult of personality. That's something that I've said uh, about them. But of course, I used to be affiliated and stream over there too. So I had a change of heart on that uh, situation. But uh, what what are your views of them? Well, initially, my impression of Fuentes was that he's highly talented just in terms of natural talent. And I thought, well, he could develop. Or, and this was the great danger, uh, what, what could happen is he could get in a really cushy place, just being himself, uh, being his 19-year-old self, uh, and not develop. And he could be lavishly rewarded for bas basically being a talented but juvenile jackass and be stuck with that for the rest of his life. And that's what seems to have happened. Uh, he doesn't seem to have much intellectual curiosity. Uh, you know he's never reading a book because he spends practically, you, you, can, you can basically, with social media, uh, pinpoint his daily schedule, you know, when he gets up at 3.30 in the afternoon or whatever, uh, you know, uh, or when he, when he goes to bed because he goes dark and uh, the, the rest of the time he's, uh, you know, doing stuff online. Uh, oftentimes he says good things, but again, uh, it's the mechanism that bothers me. It's, it's the underlying principles that uh, bother me. I, I don't think he's a very mature person. I think he's you know, highly narcissistic, uh, and uh, I, I just don't see him growing uh, as a person. Uh, I, I'd like I would. It would have been great if his basic set of talents could have been joined with uh, a ever broadening mind, uh, and uh, I just don't see that happening. And this is what happens when you get successful really early. If you get successful really early, when you're immature. You're going to find that people will make it extremely comfortable for you to just be immature. They'll reward you lavishly uh, for for doing doing that. This is this is happens with lots of rock stars and movie stars and pe people like that. Uh, the, if you're in the public eye, and especially if you make it when you're young, uh, the, the the necessity of struggle 
and the necessity of self-transcendence, self-actualization uh, is unstrung. It's undermined uh, by the fact that you just get constant adulation uh, for being 19 when you're 20 and when you're 21. He'll be 40 and he'll still be, at, be about the same level of maturity. But then uh, no one will think, well, he's got so much potential. They'll just think uh, he's juvenile and, uh, and just, just sort of a sad waste. Uh, I, think, I think he's developing into a sad waste of talent. Um, yeah, th those are my basic thoughts on the guy. Uh, I don't follow him that much, though, because uh, the, a lot of the things that he says are, are just dumb and I, I don't agree with. I hate his Putin shilling. Uh, you know, and uh, I, I thought the whole Christ is King stuff and the, the Christian branding stuff was just a, an attempt, basically. It was an attempt to drive a wedge between his followers and honest non-Christians. It and it did. It repulsed a lot of people who weren't Christian. It didn't repulse Ari Alexander. It didn't repulse grifting Jews who got involved with his movement, like Milo Yiannopoulos and, and some others. Uh, but it sure kept out the honest, non-Christian white people. Uh, stuff like that, I just think, is, uh, is, is just sadly dumb. Uh, and... Uh, I've seen these kinds of errors over and over again. I've been around long enough uh, to just think, oh God, this is just so tiresome. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what um, Fuentes is going to amount to. Uh, I don't know if he's going to lose his audience. There's a sucker born every minute. And there's a huge number of people, especially very much underparented young people, who are perfectly content to just be preyed upon by sociopathic online personalities like, like Spencer was, uh, um, was with much less talent or, or like, uh, like Fuentes is. And uh, so th there are always going to be people uh, who will apologize for him and, and shill for him. Um, and so he's always going to be around probably. Uh, he'll, he'll always be on some kind of life support. Uh, so that, that, that's my thought. It's kind of depressing. Uh, my, my hope was that he would turn into something really very good. Uh, but I just think he's going to, uh, remain stunted and largely bad and never go away. Now, uh, any thoughts on, and then I'll go back to the regular question. Um, any thoughts? Well, you could weigh in on the A stuff too, if you want to, uh, I forgot that was part of it, but, uh, what do you make of bronze age pervert and his sphere of influence? Okay. I'm, I'm not as negative as I'm, as I probably seem right now. You're, you're asking me about people, <laughs> you know, that I'm, I don't like, I could, I could wax <laughs> eloquent. All right, well, you power. know what? Tell me somebody you do like. And then, or Jared after Taylor, that. okay. Jared Taylor, Kevin McDonald, Peter Brimlow. These people are grand figures. They're great figures. Uh, they're they're thoroughly admirable people. Uh, they are the kind of people that I think should have much bigger audiences. But again, what's what, what we've got is we've got this weird, fragmented world where people have broken families and broken communities, and they form these parasocial relationships with people on the internet. And these grand old men of the movement, like Kevin McDonald, who will be 80 in January, they're, they're of a generation so far removed from this that you know these, these people can't relate to it. And so uh, I think they just have to grow into appreciating these people. This is also true of people like Jared Taylor. There are many fine people with great, uh, great platforms, uh, great messaging, great style, uh, and I, I wish they were bigger. And I kind of, uh, I, I loved the early days of social media, social media rightism, uh, social media racism, uh, social media white nationalism, when, when it really blew up on social media platforms. It was a lot of fun. It was a kind of Wild West atmosphere. It was kind of carnivalesque. Uh, uh, there, was, there was some juvenile but hilarious stuff happening. 
there's, there's no question about it. Uh, there was a lot of creativity then. I, I kind of, I'm <laughs> sentimental about a lot of that, including some of the people that I just sort of don't think much of anymore. Uh, but there was, it was a grand time. Uh, but uh, a lot of these people have just become, or they're, they're just disappointing. Uh, and, and that's the thing that we, we need to learn. Uh, if, if you, if you, okay. I'm just going to sound like an old fart for a while. Let me let me wax, old, uh, you know, on in a kind of old fart vein uh, for a while. Um, I think, and you're a much younger guy, and I, I'm present company excluded, but there are a lot of people out there who they, you know, they have chaotic families, broken down communities, they weren't really educated. Uh, very well. They've been lied to all their lives, and uh, they don't have the they don't have the ballast, I guess. Uh, you know the 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 knowledge and the character uh, to be at this for a long time, to stick with this for a long time. Now I know people who are much younger than me who who don't have these problems, and there are people that I'm trying to cultivate because they need to be running things in the future. But a lot of the flash in the pans who came up during the uh, alt-right golden era and the alt-light golden era, they've disappeared because they didn't have the character stuff uh, that, that, you, that you need. They, they didn't have the knowledge. They didn't have the character. Uh, they didn't have the work ethic, whatever. They didn't have maturity. And they didn't get any more mature with their experiences. Uh, and that's that's problematic. That's that's terrible. And I look at people now like BAP. I mean, BAP was entertaining for a few months in what 2017 or something like that. I reached out to him, wanted an interview, had a review done of his book, tried to interview him. Uh, when I found out who he was uh, a few years ago, I reached out to him again under his real name. Uh, I read his doctoral dissertation. I thought, okay, this guy's got a lot of substance. But then I'd look at his Twitter feed and it was just, you know, baby talk, baby talk and beefcake photos. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was sort of suspicious uh, about his agenda and his ethnicity. He wrote an article uh, about Israel and it's like, this man knows entirely too much about Israel. <laughs> you know, uh, he's, I, I really suspected he was Jewish uh, at that point. I didn't really look into uh, him under his own name or anything, though, because I just thought it was a kind of a waste of time. It was just an online waste of time. And uh, I really have to give credit. I think Keith Woods was the guy who really put together uh, the, the case that he was, uh, in fact, Jewish or now half Jewish, as he is willing to admit. Um, I, I think he's an intelligent person, but he's not a serious person. And in the end, this is serious business. Uh, you know, I, 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 I wrote a piece criticizing irony. I think irony can be fun, right? But ultimately, a political movement can't be uh, staffed by people who are ironic, who are playing little games. Because irony as a kind of form of existence is the opposite of commitment. And what you've got to have is you've got to have commitment. Uh, and, you know, commitment requires maturity. And I, I don't see a lot of maturity. I don't see a lot of commitment. Uh, and I don't think anything good can come out of a, a political scene where those virtues are absent and they're conspicuously absent from somebody like Kostin Alamariu. Uh, baby talk and beefcake photos aren't going to save the West. I'm sorry. Uh, and I, I wish that it were more than just a way that a lot of people waste their time online, but I don't see it as anything more than just an online waste of time. Now, let's double back to philosophy so I can get some of these in at least. Uh, who is Leo Strauss? You mentioned him earlier uh, in the conversation, conversation. And what is his influence in modern conservatism? That's a great question. Leo Strauss was a German-born Jewish political theorist. He was born, I think, in 1899. He developed 
he came to maturity. Okay, he was very much influenced by Nietzsche. He had a Jewish upbringing, uh, but he was very much influenced by Nietzsche. Uh, as a young man, uh, he became a political Zionist uh, in a political Zionist movement that took great inspiration, interestingly enough, from Mussolini's fascism. Uh, in the uh, interwar period, he attended universities in Germany and uh, wrote his doctoral dissertation. And uh, this was the time of the conservative revolutionary ferment in Germany. Uh, Spengler and uh, Heidegger, uh, these were major figures at the time uh, who influenced him, uh, especially Heidegger. Uh, Edmund Husserl, who was Heidegger's teacher, who was a big influence. Uh, writers like Muller Vandenbroek and Ernst Junger and others were taking ideas from Nietzsche and applying it to contemporary culture and arguing for the necessity of a revolutionary upheaval to return Germany to a more traditional society, more traditional archaic values. And Strauss was deeply immersed in the conservative revolutionary milieu. And, and he, was in a, he was very much a rightist. Uh, and Jewish uh, scholars at the time, like Hannah Arendt, uh, actually said that he was a kind of Jewish Nazi. Uh, but he wasn't a Nazi, but he, he could be easily mistaken for one because the Nazis sort of emerged from the same uh, conservative revolutionary interwar uh, currents of thought. Uh, and I, I find that very interesting. I've written a number of articles at Countercurrents that talk about Strauss and the conservative revolutionary milieu. There, there are letters where he talks about uh, you know, the, the true right uh, and, uh, and how uh, he, 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 in one of his uh, letters to one of his friends, Karl Lewitt, who was a uh, student of Heidegger, half Jewish, uh, he talks about the, the principles of a true right are fascist and imperialist. <laughs> You know, he's talking, uh, and I thought, wow, this is fascinating. So Strauss is a very interesting figure in the interwar period. Then he he got out of, oh, he was also uh, very much impressed with Carl Schmitt, who was one of the interwar conservative revolutionary giants, intellectual giants. Schmitt thought that Strauss understood him better than anybody who had reviewed his book, The Concept of the Political. Uh, Schmidt helped Strauss get a fellowship to leave Germany and go study and write about Hobbes in the UK. Uh, so he went to the UK, he went to France, and eventually went to the United States. Uh, he taught at the New School for Social Research uh, in the 40s. Uh, and then after that, he went to the University of Chicago, and he founded a, very, a school of thought that, that people call the Straussians. He taught in the Committee on Social Thought. He taught political, philosoph uh, political philosophy courses uh, for decades. He published a large number of books. And what happened, though, is in the late 40s, Strauss sort of kept submerged in the background his sympathies with thinkers like Nietzsche, Heidegger, and so forth. Uh, why? Because it was all redolent of the Nazis, right? Uh, he pushed that into the background, and he reinvented himself as a defender of the natural rights tradition in American conservatism. Uh, and uh, a lot of his, uh, and, and so uh, he was a Cold War liberal, is one way you could understand him, or Cold War conservative, uh, the kind of conservatism that came into existence in the 40s and 50s around National Review. One of the things that Strauss talked about, which I think is of enduring significance, is how to read the tradition of political philosophy. He said that writers uh, have to be mindful of persecution, of political persecution. And he, there's a book he has called Persecution and the Art of Writing. Most societies are illiberal. Even liberal societies, it turns out, are illiberal. Uh, even liberal societies don't really tolerate illiberal thought. And so if you are a thinker who's out of step with the dominant orthodoxies of your society and you want to communicate, you have to communicate in a sneaky way. 
You have to communicate your true views between the lines. You have to look like uh, you belong in the society around you. You know, pay honor to its you know to its idols. You know, be pious uh, to its civic idols, its religious idols, and so forth. And somehow get your message across in a subtler way to people who are open-minded enough to take you seriously. And so uh, he came up with a way of reading texts that respected this, that, that you know, great thinkers in the past always had to be mindful of orthodoxies when they had unorthodox ideas. And so you have to be attentive to the sneaky ways that they put this across. He called, he called this exoteric writing. And a, a lot of people call this esoteric reading, I guess. The exoteric is reading the surface, uh, and the esoteric uh, reading is the deeper hidden meaning. Uh, and I think he's totally correct about this. And a lot of his texts, by training you to be attentive to these uh, little techniques of misdirection, uh, really open up the history of political philosophy. In a, in a surprising way. So that's a huge uh, contribution. Uh, practically everybody who teaches political theory in America is influenced by Strauss at this point. Uh, he created a very, very powerful kind of cultish school, which is characteristic of Jewish intellectuals who have a kind of guru-like influence on their followers. Uh, and uh, it's a kind of mixed bag uh, because... Uh, you know, there, there, there are a lot of things about their agenda that I disagree with. Uh, they're very much caught up with um, neoconservatism uh, today. Uh, and uh, they, they put forward a false image of American history. Uh, they didn't invent this false image of American history, but they very much institutionalized and popularized it. And what is that false image of American history? It's the liberal image of American history. It's the idea that America was founded on universal liberal principles uh, and that anybody who adheres to these liberal principles can be an American. Now, if you go back to the American founding, that is not how they thought of what they were doing. So, so some people thought that way, but th by and large, uh, they did not think, oh, uh, anybody who ascribes to certain natural rights theories uh, can be an American. Uh, they had a much more thick, uh, folkish understanding of American identity. It was caught up with the British Isles. It was caught up with Protestantism. It was caught up with common law and various traditions. And the, the, Brit the American Constitution wasn't even liberal in the classical liberal sense. Uh, it, it had more to do with the tradition of Republican thought that goes all the way back to Aristotle uh, and the Romans. Uh, it came forward through Machiavelli and uh, uh, Montesquieu and others like that. Uh, America was not a classical liberal society. Uh, that, that image of America is just false. And But you find that image throughout American conservatism today. You find it in libertarianism. Uh, and why was Strauss pushing that? Well, because he was ethnically and religiously a complete outsider to, to the America uh, of the founders. Uh, he was a German-born Jew, and it was realized long before Strauss came along, of course, that uh, unless America's identity was reconfigured to be basically propositional rather than ethnic, that uh, these immigrant groups would always be outsiders, and that would be an impediment to their social upward mobility. And so uh, there was a, a concerted effort to redefine America, not as a, a, a people, a Northern European people, uh, a, 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 a Protestant people, a people that spoke the English language, that had its roots primarily in the British Isles and allied people in Northern Europe, they're very similar, uh, to basically a nation for everyone who believes in the American dream or life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness or the sacred principle that all men are created equal. Uh, this kind of false civic nationalist view of America was very powerfully instituted by the Straussians. Uh, and it is completely a dogma 
uh, amongst American conservatives today. I think that's one of the worst uh, parts of Strauss's legacy. Uh, also, because he was such an impressive figure uh, and openly Jewish and his uh, leanings, his background and his uh, identity and his uh, loyalties, uh, he created a great deal of loyalty, even amongst non-Jewish scholars, to uh, Jewish intellectualism uh, amongst uh, on the American right. There are a lot of Catholic Straussians, uh, for instance, who are very loyal to and protective of Jews because of the influence of Leo Strauss. Uh, and so it's really been one of the, the foundations of the neoconservative movement in America. The, the, there are two wellsprings of neoconservatism in America. One is the Straussians and the other is the Zionist wing of the Trotskyite movement, which is really hard to wrap your head around uh, when you think, how did, how did the Zionist followers of Leon Trotsky, who was a communist after all, one of the founders, become one of the pillars of neoconservatism in America? To understand how that happened is to understand just how far American conservatism has strayed from having anything to do with America and anything to do with conserving anything except the power of a largely now foreign oligarchy. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I mentioned that sometimes on the show too uh, about the neoconservative history. Uh, now, let's see. Um, oh, uh, recently you released The Trial of Socrates. Could you tell us about it and how it explores the tensions between intellectual freedom and social order? Yeah, uh, well, this is a, a a book that I wrote like 25 years ago. It, it first became, it, it, its first form was a lecture course that I gave in Atlanta. It was an adult education lecture course. And I really loved that course. Uh, and I, I found the tapes of it years later and uh, digitized them and, st and started editing them. and and put them up at countercurrents and people liked them even though the sound quality was terrible. People liked them and they, uh, they, they started asking for transcriptions. And so I got this guy who was a very good transcriber who learned a lot of philosophy, transcribing a lot of my philosophy lectures. And so the transcriptions were up for years. And it was during COVID uh, when I was sort of, well, not going out and enjoying life very much like most of humanity. Yeah, I started uh, revisiting a lot of these things that I had done years before. And I started thinking, I really would like to turn the trial of Socrates stuff into a book. And so I set to work on that. And uh, this year it, it came out. Uh, and it's a book about uh, Socrates, obviously, and about his trial. Uh, it's very Straussian in a lot of ways because, uh, again, he very much influenced the way I read Plato's dialogues because Plato's dialogues are dramas. And Strauss was very attentive to the fact that these are dramas. They're like little plays and you have to uh, understand the characters and their motives and their interactions. The, the meaning of a platonic dialogue is not just the things that Socrates says, you know, you, you can't just get, get uh, Socrates' philosophy or Plato's philosophy by going through and basically typing out everything that Socrates says, uh, or, uh, because that's not the meaning of it. The meaning of it is the total effect of everything that Socrates says and the other people in the dialogue say, plus the things that they do, the gestures they make, the, the the deeds that are narrated. And so it's an amazingly complex, you know, form of bookkeeping <laughs> to, to take all of these things into account. You've got to read them like novels or read them like plays. Uh, and the, the total effect on the reader, the attentive reader at the end, is what the message is. And uh, so I, that's how I read these things. Now it's, it sounds maybe overly complex and uh, maybe overly academic, but it's not because these are very compelling stories. Uh, Socrates was a martyr for philosophy. Uh, he is somebody that everybody knows about. Even Bill and Ted know about Socrates, right? Uh, and he's one of the most influential people in the history of the West and because the West has gone global in the history of the world. And so knowing a bit about him is, uh, is 
part of what educated people should do. Uh, and if your college is teaching you nothing but intersectionalism and stuff like that, and you don't get any Plato, uh, read the trial of Socrates. He'll get you on your way to understanding uh, some of the foundational texts in Western civilization. So what I deal with in there is a dialogue, or is, is the play by Aristophanes called Clouds, which is basically the charges against Socrates. Socrates was put on trial for atheism and corruption of the youth. And the, the ultimate charges were based on this play by Aristophanes. It was about a quarter century before the actual trial happened, but it sort of created the atmosphere that led to the charges against Socrates. And so I, I spent some time reading carefully the meaning of that play and showing that Aristophanes was a profoundly philosophical, profoundly conservative character really a brilliant uh, guy. And then I talk about some plays by, or some dialogues plays by uh, Plato that deal with the trial and death of Socrates, and I go through them one after the other, uh, and just show you how to read these things uh, and uh, what the lessons are. And the lessons, I think, are you know genuinely relevant to this day. And uh, the, the great conflict is between philosophy which searches for the truth of things and is not content with traditions and social opinions and what they say, what we say around here. Uh, and yet, this is problematic. Why? Because the cement that holds society together consists of opinions. And not just opinions about what's going on in the news, right? Opinions about human nature, about the good life, about the gods, and so forth. So philosophy, by its nature, ends up poking at and maybe stabbing at, you know, the, uh, the things that are, are foundational to uh, people's idea of a good society and a good life. And so it's very easy to think that philosophy might be a subversive force. And early on, Greek philosophy was very subversive. Uh, and Socrates was guilty, guilty as charged. Uh, he really didn't believe in the gods of the city. Uh, he really did believe in things that were subversive of good morals and so forth. However, the sad truth is, is that Socrates changed. He grew. He evolved. But the public opinion of him as a ne'er-do-well and malcontent and corrupter of the youth didn't evolve along with it. And so by the time Socrates was a mature man, uh, he had gotten away from the more destructive forms of philosophy and was actually something of a conservative. Uh, and I show, you know, for instance, in, in this dialogue called Euthyphro, which is, deals with the idea of piety, that Socrates had had gone from being a alienated critic of social conventions about piety to being a defender of conventional ideas about piety from the kind of alienated critic that he used to be. So there's this character named Euthyphro uh, who's behaving in absolutely atrocious ways and he thinks he's being pious. And Socrates, by questioning him, tries to get him to realize, no, there's actually something good about these conventional views of piety, namely that they are the foundations of families and cities, social order, and that we hadn't ought to undermine these things in a kind of casual way. Uh, he, he's, he's there trying to get Euthyphro to reflect on the folly of his ways. But of course, this was lost on a lot of people because every time they saw Socrates, he was just asking questions in the, in the marketplace. Um, and the, the sad thing is, is that a subversive philosopher and an essentially conservative philosopher basically look the same. If you're not very practiced at following their arguments and, and seeing what they're trying to do. And so what I argue is that by the end of his life, Socrates was actually very critical of philosophy as you know just an activity that says 
screw it, you know, uh, screw convention, screw piety, uh, screw the God, screw it all. We just, we're just going to speak the truth and investigate and do what, do what we want, right? Uh, he used to be that way, and a lot of Greek philosophers were that way, and it was destructive. And so at the end of his life, what he tried to do is he tried to arrive at a way that he could engage in free intellectual inquiry without undermining society. And the way you do that is, well, it's, it's what Leo Strauss described. It's, it's basically uh, exoteric speaking. Uh, speaking in such a way that you are conventionally pious, conservative, salutary, don't upset society, don't scare the hose. Yet, at the same time, you are also communicating radical thoughts to people who are really attentive. Uh, and so you can, you can be both a free thinker and a good citizen at the same time. And so there's an attempt to harmonize these, these clashing interests uh, in, in Socrates and Plato's philosophy. And so I bring that all out in The Trial of Socrates. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's the long and the short of it. Very cool. Now, North sent this in earlier. It's a little bit back to Ukraine, but he says, don't know if you'll have time to ask. Well, I'm asking. He says, but I would like to know, he talks of Ukraine looking west. By this, does he mean joining the EU? And then if so, does he understand that will mean the, an end to ethnic Ukraine, he said. Yeah, a lot of people make that argument. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, this is actually an argument that's very commonly made by by Russians. Uh, this was very very common uh, back in 2013, 2014. If if they if they join the West, they'll be flooded with migrants. Okay. Well, there there are two problems with this. First of all, uh, Putin is already flooding the parts of Ukraine that he controls with non-whites. He's bringing in Asiatics and people from the stands to settle in the ruins of places like Mariupol, where ethnic Ukrainians have been run off. And indeed, this has been a pattern with Russian imperialism. Russian imperialism has been devastating to the ethnic interests of the peoples who have been conquered. And we're seeing that unfold. Uh, Russian imperialism, Soviet imperialism in places like the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, absolutely catastrophic for the native peoples of those countries. Uh, what's happened since uh, Poland, Ukraine, well, not, I'm sorry, Poland and the Baltic states have joined NATO and the EU? Have they been flooded with migrants? No, they really haven't. Now, it is a problem. They're part of the Schengen zone. If somebody is approved as a resident of Europe in one Schengen country, they can go all over the place. Uh, but they haven't been flooded with these migrants. And the, the idea that, oh, if you, if you look to the West, your ethnic interests will be totally destroyed, just rings false for these people because these people have been susceptible, subjected to massive ethnic replacement by the Russians, not the West. And they also do see, yeah, it's bad in Western Europe. There's no question about it. It's very bad. But... These countries resist that. Poland ha has been uh, against refugee resettlement uh, after the migrant crisis. Hungary has been against refugee resettlement uh, after the migrant crisis. Uh, there, there is a block of sensible countries in Central and Eastern Europe, all of them former communist countries, uh, that are opposed to the great replacement in Europe and have stood against that. Now, my view is that if Ukraine joined the EU and joined NATO, uh, but mostly the EU, let's talk about the EU first of all, that uh, they would strengthen the anti-immigration, anti-replacist block. Because Ukraine is a very based country. There are all these based Poland memes. Well, Poland is not as based as Ukraine. I love Poland, I've been there a number of times, I've been to Ukraine, and Ukrainians are even, if possible, more based than the Poles, even more, if, if possible, more based than the Hungarians. Uh, they're just stubbornly uh, resistant to 
these kooky replacist ideologies because it sounds like communist stuff to them. And they're just allergic to anything that smells of communist stuff to them. Uh, and so I, I, I think that they would be actually a block, a part of, they would strengthen the anti-replacement block in Europe rather than be overwhelmed by migrants. So th that's my basic uh, response to that. A, replacement comes from the East, not the West, as far as most of these countries like Ukraine are concerned. Uh, and second, if they joined the EU, if they joined NATO, they would strengthen the block in the EU, in NATO, that's, that opposes m migrants and refugees and the great replacement. And I think that would be a good thing. All right, now let's see. Uh, what would you say to young nationalists who feel depressed and disenfranchised? Why should they stay in the movement? Also, I have a bunch of questions, but we ain't gonna be able to get through them all. Uh, but I, I was gonna roll I'll be through fast. A few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. I, you know, I like the guests to just uh, expound, so I don't, I don't usually interrupt if they're going off like that. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Okay, what would I say to young nationalists who are getting depressed? Well, I'm not depressed. Okay, one of the reasons why I think a lot of nationalists get depressed is because they look up on the stage of the movement and they see that certain figures are disappearing. They're going dark, they're going silent, they get burned out, whatever. I have a different perspective though. I'm up on the stage and I'm looking out at the audience and I see web traffic statistics and I see the audience growing. Half my audience has come to me since 2018. People who say, oh, Charlottesville was a terrible disaster. We've never recovered from it. Half the people who read Countercurrents today never heard of Countercurrents when Charlottesville happened. They've come to it since 2018. It's not just ancient history to them. It's prehistory to them. That's how fast things are growing. Uh, the, the real right is growing. The audience for our stuff is growing. It's just that it might look like the movement's shrinking because you're paying attention to the wrong numbers. You're paying attention to content creators or whatever. And you know some of them have gone dark, uh, but you're not paying attention to the stuff that I see because, well, you're not in a position to see it. You're not looking at the stats. So I'm extremely hopeful. That's a huge white pill. Uh, chop it up, snort it up. <laughs> Be happy, you know. Uh, it's a, it's extremely uh, encouraging. Uh, so don't give up on the movement. Uh, a lot of what's happening, I think, is that people who got into this a while ago, are, you know, and were extremely online. You're, another thing I've noticed is that just people in my, they're, they're not on the stage of the movement, but they're sort of in my chat circles and stuff like that. I, some of those people have gone silent. I kind of worry about them from, you know, I'll reach out sometimes. It's like, hey, uh, you know, how are you doing? Have you become a liberal Democrat or something? None of them have become liberal Democrats. No, what's happened is, you know, they've started a family. Years ago, when Trump, before Trump was elected, I predicted that there would be a Trump baby boom. And uh, I was hoping, uh, you know, after Trump was such a massive disappointment uh, and more women were in the workforce than ever before and all this stuff, I just thought, well, I hope nobody con confronts me with this cringe-inducing, stupid, uh, you know, prediction that there was a Trump baby boom. It turns out there was actually a Trump baby boom. Uh, and there was certainly a Trump baby boom in our circles. I know a number of women in our circles who went off the pill when Donald Trump got elected. And uh, I've, I've known a number of, I know a number of families that have happened since 2016, 2017, and they've been growing. When you have little ones, you just don't spend enough, uh, that much time online. You're not chatting with your bros in gaming servers or chats, you know, ch you know forums and stuff like that. It's not because they become liberal Democrats. It's because they're growing up and starting families and they're just being good white people. Uh, and so a lot of uh, a lot of the shrinkage you might be experiencing in certain online spaces is just that. Uh, and, and don't despair. Uh, it, it's, it's actually a sign of success in some ways. Uh, 
and these people will be back, right? Uh, if, if you ever need them, they'll be back. Uh, they, they haven't changed their minds, uh, but they, they're just less online in some ways. But that's a good thing. Uh, I'm told that groipers are growing up. Uh, it's inevitable with the passage of time. Uh, and so uh, th that's, a, that's also a good thing. So you know, don't despair. Now, uh, last question, and like I said, we'll have to do it again because I, I didn't get to everything. Uh, there's there's still a lot of questions we could do too, but uh, how can whites uh, embrace a more collective racial identity? Well, it's a great question. Everything that we're propagandized with is basically saying, uh, be an individual. <laughs> None of this collective stuff matters. Well, there, there are a couple things though. Uh, one, you might want to be an individual, but they're not going to let you. Our enemies are not going to let you be an individual. You, you can't skate away from white guilt by saying, hey, I'm an individual, man. Uh, you know, you can't do something like Fritz Perls' gestalt prayer and pray away the white guilt uh, and the white privilege narratives that's been weaponized against you. Uh, you can't do that. It's just not going to happen. So, uh, in a way, what they're doing is they're forcing us to collectivize to, just to survive, and that's a good thing. But here's the other thing. We're already collectivized. It's just in our blood. Uh, it's, in our, it's in our language. Uh, I mean, we are biologically part of a group. We're not aware of that because we're out there living our lives uh, and we're distracted from it. But biologically, we're already part of a collective. Uh, and we actually feel more comfortable, biologically speaking, around people who are more like us. Genetic similarity is a real thing. Uh, there, you have more harmony with people who are genetically similar to you than people who are genetically different, which means that diversity is a source of disharmony in society, and all that diversity stuff is just nonsense, right? So biologically, we're already collectivized, but we've just got to become aware of that fact. Uh, culturally, we're already collectivized. Uh, how is that the case? Well, it's the language we speak, right? It's the, it's the conventions we share, the customs that we share. Uh, we do things around here in ways that are different from the way they do things on the other side of the globe. And so a lot of the, the problem of collectivization uh, it seems like a big, it seems like a much bigger problem when you think, how do you make people more collective? How do you, when you envision it as getting ideas into people's heads that aren't already there and that might be blocked by individualist programming, it becomes a somewhat easier task when you realize, no, actually, we're always already collective. And what's happened to us is we've just been distracted from it and made to forget it. Uh, and so our people are already on our side. Uh, it's just that they have to be made aware of it. And, and so it's just a matter of getting people to reflect on biological relatedness, a feeling of brotherhood and kin kinship. It's there, it's real. It's more real than their ANCAP ideology or their liberal ideology, right? It's more real than their ideology. It's it's a matter of feeling, but it can also be articulated and it can be made the basis of, of a political movement. So the, our people are already on our side. There's a great story in uh, Charlton Heston's autobiography in the 1960s. Uh, it, it was 1964 when Barry Goldwater was running for president. And Heston was being driven back and forth uh, in a limousine to a movie set where he's making a movie. And every day he'd pass by a billboard uh, for Barry Goldwater that said, in your heart, you know he's right. Mm -hmm. And he's, he saw this day after day after day. And he, and he said at a certain point, he thought, son of a bitch, he is right. And he became a Republican. We have to, I, I'm, I'm going to title a book this someday because I think it's kind of a douchey move to title a book this way, but I'm going to write a book called In Your Heart, You Know I'm Right, because that's 
the operating assumption that I carry around, that in all of our people's hearts, they know we're right. And so again, it's not a matter of sticking foreign ideas in their heads so much as getting them in touch with their real feelings. And once they get in touch with the really real feelings, all that ideology will just disappear. Greg Johnson, thank you for taking so much time with us today. Uh, I really appreciate that very thorough interview. And we got to touch on a lot too as well. So uh, I appreciate you stopping by. Now tell them about countercurrents again uh, and where they can find your stuff and, and the operation there. Well, countercurrents is 13 years and a half old. It's www.counter-currents.com. And you got to put the hyphen in there or you get to some south asian marxist <laughs> website i think uh anyway countercurrents.com uh we have new material five days a week usually about 20 things a week we have a lot of very very solid regular writers I'll, again i'll just reel off a few jim goad travis leblanc spencer quinn uh stephen foster mark gullick myself uh, we, uh, there's, there's a German writer that I'm very, very fond of who started writing for us recently, Clarissa Schnabel, uh, and on and on. Uh, we have a, a lot of really interesting voices uh, covering everything, the news, but also culture, you know, popular culture, high culture, and the humanities, history, et cetera, from a pro-white point of view. So countercurrence is about everything from our point of view, it's written on a high level, but it's not stuffy, I hope. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's genuinely engaging. There's a lot of new stuff there. I wish you would make it your homepage. Uh, we also do uh, live streams on Saturdays, Countercurrents Radio. Nothing like the reach of the kill stream, of course, but still, uh, we, we do our best. We, we have our regular uh, presence. And Ethan, I, I'm so happy that you did this. I interviewed you once years ago on Countercurrents Radio. Yes. Trav LeBlanc, uh, was the guy who said, Ralph is like the MVP for whatever year this was. I forget <laughs> what year it was. He's, uh, he's, he's great because he, um, he platforms us and he's uh, a good interviewer. And this is a good interview. I, I really appreciate it. You did, you did some prep uh, and, I, and I appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you very much. I, and thank everybody, everybody out there for listening. Well, thank you for saying that. Yeah, I did do a little prep. I really enjoyed it. Countercurrents, well worth your time, I'll say. Uh, a lot of new stuff there. And I, I like how they put the, of course, I like to read um, more than I like to listen. But sometimes, you know, if it's somebody like Goat or something like that, I, I like that they have um, like an audio version uh, of the article that you could listen to uh, as well. So that's a nice touch and uh, just a great operation. And I had a great time today, man. Yeah, thank you so much. And I appreciate the kind words. Uh, and let's do it again sometime. Yeah, let's definitely do it again. All right, Greg Johnson here, live on the Kill Stream. Thank you, sir. Thank you for watching this clip. This is the CAC of Lofa. Remember to like and subscribe.